Hey, everybody. My name is Seth, and if we haven't met before, it's a pleasure to kind of meet you uh, from this uh, position anyway. I am from Corvallis, and I did attend the university of which we shall not name here this morning. Uh, but it is a joy to be here. My wife is actually from Eugene, and I really, really do love the city. I've always enjoyed the city. I've just kept that love on the low. Uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> But uh, it's been really exciting to see Pastor Chris and this amazing team start and launch this really great church and to see the ways that it's grown and all the lives that it's getting to impact. That's really, really fun. And uh, we've had something really special planned here in Corvallis for a while, having Pastor Keith Tower involved. And the fact that you guys get to piggyback off of that is one of the great benefits of being a family of churches together. Um, so he gets to come out and little, get a little bit of a two-for-one. He did a marriage seminar for us yesterday, and it, it is phenomenal. It's really good. If nothing else, he's seven foot tall and played seven years in the NBA with Shaquille O'Neal and Michael Jordan and stuff like that. So like every childhood NBA star I looked up to, he was right in that era. Uh, so if you just want to hear, you could just totally skip the marriage stuff and ask him like basketball stories, and then he'd, he'd get into it. Uh, <laughs> Husbands don't do that. Your wives would shake your head if you tried to do that. <laughs> he tells lots of really uh, cool stories, and it's super helpful, really super helpful stuff. So hope you guys can make that uh, tomorrow. Uh, today here, we, uh, we get to talk about Jesus and the Bible a little bit. Does that sound all right with you? Yeah. Well, that's all I got, so you got to be all right with it. Uh, it's gonna, how it's going to go. Um, I'm reading the Bible in Galatians chapter 5 in just a moment. You guys are in a series talking about the Holy Spirit, which is oftentimes probably the most forgotten member of the whole Godhead sort of deal. You know, he's like the, the third member of Destiny's Child that no one can remember, right? It's just kind of like, yeah, yeah, I got Beyonce, Kelly Rowland, and who's that other one again, right? Um, yeah, I know, Michelle. But poor Michelle, she kind of gets forgotten. And sometimes the Holy Spirit gets that way. We can quickly forget the Holy Spirit a lot of times because the Father gets all this publicity because, you know, Jesus loved his Father and uh, the Father loved Jesus and, uh, and we get this amazing Dad in Heaven who cares about us and the Father's love and the Father's heart and all this wonderful Father stuff. We pray, we say, Our Father who art in Heaven. So Father, he gets a lot of shout-outs, you know. We give it up to him. And Jesus, for sure, like uh, Jesus certainly makes our vocabulary quite often and he gets into the mix. We understand him being the one uh, that came as a man and sacrificed himself for us died on the cross for our sins. That's all good. And then the Holy Spirit kind of just is this tag along, third wheel, right? That we don't oftentimes give a whole lot of attribution to or credit for or acknowledgement of. But if you were to actually look at the words of Jesus and to look at how much he spoke of the Holy Spirit, you would see just how vitally critical his role, not just in terms of how the universe was formed and shaped and even in terms of the inner dynamics of God himself, but you would see just how significant the Holy Spirit is meant to be in our lives. I remember uh, when I first became a Christian, uh, I was a college student, I was a sophomore, and I remember being so um, enamored. One of the initial things that really helped me to cross the line of faith, um, I didn't grow up in a home uh, with, a, with a really positive dad experience, and so for me, the idea of finding a father that knew me, that loved me, that, that even any earthly father, no matter how good they actually were, could only ever be a shadow of an expression of, uh, but finding a father that loved me, that knew me, that created me, uh, that was with me, that was for me, uh, this was just an incredible thing. And then even the idea that the father would send his son, that the son would sacrifice, that I didn't have to earn my way to him, but he actually found a way to find his way to me, was incredible. And it was, uh, I gave my life to Jesus on a Friday night. A Saturday night, I was still buzzing. Sunday morning, I went to church. And I was sitting in church. I was having the time of my life. Because I'd been to church just a few times before. I didn't grow up in church, but I was kind of checking out the Jesus thing for a little while. And just, I'd been in church several times. And, uh, you know, sometimes it was hit, sometimes it was miss. It didn't, uh, it didn't matter to me a whole lot. I would usually skip worship, show up for like three quarters of the sermon or so, bounce early so that no one could say hi to me or do their Jesus juju on me. <laughs> like, I just kind of, uh, that was kind of my routine. And I remember for the first time sitting in church, and the music wasn't any better, and the preaching wasn't any better, and the people weren't any less weird. Like, none of that had changed. And yet, I was just enamored. I was enamored with it. And there was something about me that wanted to be there and that enjoyed worshiping, even though, like, no one sings in public. And I don't have a great singing voice, and barely in the shower do I ever let out a tune. Um, Occasionally, let it go will come to my mind, only because my daughter has watched that movie so many times on repeat. It's just forever. It's like a tattoo in your mind. It won't go away. Um, but yeah, you don't, you, don't, you don't sing often. But I found myself almost just compelled to do so. And it was one of the first mornings as I was sitting there, even just listening to the sermon and the teaching, where I was hearing the words out of the man's mouth and even hearing the scriptures being read to me, and it registered 
like stuff started clicking. I was like, well, that makes sense, and I get that, and I see how that matters to me, and I want to go do that. And it was indescribable feeling of all of a sudden something internal had changed and shifted. And where it was just dead and information and just a ritual or routine before, now something had come alive in me. And even for the first time sitting, sitting in that service, I remember hearing these thoughts in my head and thinking to myself, those, those are not my thoughts telling me, here's something I want you to do this week and here's what I want you to do with your life. And I remember hearing these thoughts like, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I, where, where, I literally at one point thought I was going a little crazy in my head because I kept hearing all these things that were leading me and pushing me and, spe- and just giving me these feelings and impressions. And it felt almost, almost as if I had developed an alternative personality. And it was the first time I had ever heard and felt the influence of the Holy Spirit, not just coming from someone else externally, but actually coming from somewhere inside myself internally. Um, And it has been utterly transforming to know that God isn't just Father, isn't just Son, but is the Spirit that is not only available to me, accessible to me, but actually lives within me and is guiding me and is empowering me. And that has been an utterly transforming experience for me. Some of you might know this. Some of you might know a glimpse of this. Some of you might uh, be totally foreign to this whole idea. But the Holy Spirit is such a critical part of the Christian life. Jesus actually said, just prior to his murder, when he was going to die and, and, and give away his life on the cross, he was actually telling his followers that it's going to be better for you that I go. Um, which I, have you ever tried to put yourself like in the scene and pretend you're one of his followers listening to Jesus at the time? Right? That would have been one of those moments where I'm like, it'll be better for you if I go. And I'd be, False. You've been true about a lot of things, Jesus, but hey, no one bats a thousand. I get it. It's all good. False on that one. I'm calling, I'm calling fiction. But he insisted that it's better for you that I go so that the Spirit can come. Because the reality of, of a um, Jesus being in one isolated location at any given moment in time is far inferior to the Spirit of God that can be with anyone and everyone anywhere possible in any given moment. And he was insistent that even the things that I have done through the power of the Holy Spirit, you will actually do greater things than this. So if Jesus is this insistent upon it, as Jesus is this emphatic about the Holy Spirit and the role it's meant to play in our lives, and certainly we, we got we to take it serious. You have to take it serious if you want to take Jesus serious. And so let's uh, take a look in Galatians 5. But one of the very key aspects of the Holy Spirit and what it produces in our lives, what he, I shouldn't say it, what he produces in our lives. Um, and we're going to look about the effect of the outcome, what happens once the Spirit actually goes in. So we're going to start from verse 16. Verse 16, and we're going to try to get in the flow of the thought. Uh, this is the book of Galatians, which is, uh, there's actually no such thing as uh, a, like a city of Galatia. It was actually written to a region or a collection of churches. Um, and so this was a letter that was written to kind of help guide and instruct Christians very early on in the church. And, uh, and so we're going to get into the flow of thought of this letter a little bit till we get right to the heart of what it's trying to say about uh, the Holy Spirit specifically here. So it says this, so I say, live by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So the basic, the basic premise that's going to be set up here is that there are competing agendas and even affections and desires happening in our life in any given moment as followers of Jesus. That there are desires of the spirit and there are desires of the flesh. And somehow these things are in contrast with each other and the encouragement is go with the spirit. I think you could have figured that one out. If you were to take, what am I going to place my bet on, flesh or spirit? I'll go with spirit. Right? So I say live by the Spirit, and when you do so, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. It goes on to describe these fleshly desires, what they look like. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh then are obvious, and it goes on to list a few. Uh, Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, like I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So this, this is his basic insistence, that when we live according to the Spirit, it won't look like anything on that very long list. That the way you treat your body and the way you treat others will be honor and dignity and respect, 
the way you actually conduct yourself in the world will be in alignment with God's plan for the world and not just what you want for yourself at any given moment. And if you are led by the Spirit, and if the Spirit is actually the thing giving you life, then this will be the thing that you will ultimately want to follow. You won't want to go the path of the flesh, but you actually want what the Spirit wants. Now, this is a little bit of a tricky sort of theological idea. Let me set this down right here. Because when we think of flesh, it's a very interesting word in the original language that they've had to translate and kind of help us to wrap our minds around in English. The idea of flesh oftentimes gets this connotation of my physical body itself, right? We think of our skin, our flesh, our body. And so there's something of the spirit, which is immaterial, and then there's something of the flesh, which is material. And so what can easily be interpreted is somehow like God wants us to really embrace the things that are immaterial, like spiritual, and to really deny the things that are material or physical. But this is a really bad, really bad understanding of what's going on here. The idea of the physical is that it is in, it's just filled with everything that we would call spirit. And in the biblical categories, there's no such thing as spiritual only because there's no such thing as something that is or is not having spiritual implications. In fact, even the very idea of Jesus himself as the Son of God, actually 100% God, coming incarnating and becoming a human is the idea of the convergence of the physical and the spirit, and it was all good. It's not like Jesus had like the physical part of him that was like not all good, and the spirit part of him that was all good, and he had this warring faction going on. And Jesus lived the life of harmony, of spirit and flesh, in the sense that it was a good representation in the physical world of everything God had ever intended it to be. So the idea is not that we're warring with our physical bodies, but we're wanting the spirit to come in cooperation with how we live our lives. That there's these innate desires that we have that we're not meant to gratify, but we are meant to live by the Spirit and what it ultimately desires. And when we live by the Spirit, when we live by the Spirit, this is when the Scriptures say that we find freedom, which is a very interesting argument. Because if we were just to pull the room really quickly and ask ourselves, what do we think freedom is? Most of us will say something along the lines of freedom is like the ability to do whatever we want, like whenever we want. Or something, or something like that? Like we think of financial freedom. You think of having some giant windfall so that you can, just, you can just do whatever, whenever. Take a private jet here, like take a yacht there, like eat a fine meal wherever, whenever you might actually want. But what we often define as freedom is going to get us in trouble if we want to put that lens upon Jesus because Jesus would actually take that idea of freedom, the ability to do whatever, whenever, as something very, very different. The scriptures actually call that Slavery. Slavery. And let me, let me point to you why. <clears throat> Some of you had a good Christmas. I had a good Christmas. And uh, I had a good thing going in the fall. I was exercising and I was eating not terribly. Uh, that's about as good as I can do is not terribly. And, uh, but Christmas came and all bets were off. And you might say that I went on just a classical freedom diet. Have you ever been on a freedom diet? It is insanely amazing. Uh, it is really, really good. Uh, donuts, donuts with bacon on it, for crying out loud. That is a thing, and praise God for it. <laughs> just fried foods and fast food and just like big dinners from everything from Thanksgiving to Christmas dinner, and just just going for it. And for me, I've got, uh, I've got a little bit of thing where everyone kind of has their, their vices, but for me, it's just only sugar, salt, and fat. Those are the three things, really that I just have my personal struggle with. But other than that, I'm totally, totally great. Sugar, salt. Sugar, salt, and fat. And I find that when I'm on the freedom diet, eating whatever I want and whenever I want, <clears throat> that I only ever want more of what I eat. And sugar, salt, and fat have amazing ability to do that, doesn't it? I think McDonald's has figured it out, which is why every time you see them like salt their fries, they dump like 13 pounds of it on a single fry, I'm pretty sure. Because they know the more you eat of this, the more you will want of this. And just try. You eat whatever you want for a week, and you find yourself only ever wanting that thing. You think you're free. You think you're free. I'm just doing whatever, man. And it's actually hooking you. And all you have to do is try to stop, make a New Year's resolution, and see how that goes. It's doing whatever, whenever, is actually far less free than we can imagine. 
And let's just paint the picture on a long-term brush here. What most people would call freedom, and you can break this down into multiple categories, if you live completely free in terms of your diet, you'll actually experience restriction in terms of long-term health and longevity. Correct? If you live free in terms of your work life, the amount of hours that you put into work, if you put in 70 and 80 hours and you make work your everything and you, you completely buy into it, you can say, I am free to pour everything into that work, but the reality is it's going to catch up with you. It's called ulcers and anxiety. And again, you're going to restrict your relationships, your connections with your family, your close friends are all going to die, and you're going to find even your physical health begin to deteriorate out from right out from under your feet. People in the recovery community know this very, very well, that what might have started by a free choice to live free and do whatever I want whenever I want, when whatever chemical uh, enters your body and gives you whatever high you might have been looking for in that moment, what might have started as freedom quickly becomes something else as that thing actually begins to take hold of you and driving you to only ever want more of it. And your life actually becomes very, very narrow as you actually begin to only ever want a very small and limited thing and be having to have it. Freedom is very paradoxical. It's very paradoxical. And the simple idea here is that living by the Spirit is not living in any way you want to. It's living in the right ways you're supposed to, that you were made to. And so what often feels just like letting go, going with the flow, and giving in is far more in the direction of flesh than actually standing against the current of that according to what the Spirit is actually wanting. And when you just give in to all those things, you might find momentary pleasures, you might find things that satisfy temporarily, but you'll never find anything that will do anything but enslave and ultimately bring death. And if there's any agenda that God has ever had from page one of the Bible to the last page of it, it is life. Life. And we all have all these definitions floating on our head about how we can create it for ourselves. But the maker of it actually is insistent upon there is a way to it. And it is not through the flesh. It is through the spirit. Now he continues on in this thought. And he says, when you live by the spirit, you won't just gratify the flesh. But here's what will happen. But the fruit of the spirit, he says, is love, joy, peace, forbearance kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh along with his passions and desires. So here's the basic idea. This is a really a relatively popular little passage in the scriptures, and the idea of the fruit of the Spirit is, uh, is one that's semi-frequently spoken of uh, in churches and Bible sorts of contexts. Uh, but it's, I would argue, one of the least understood. Because it's one of those things when we say fruit. Fruit becomes this often used metaphor inside of Christian circles where we use it a lot, but we don't really know what we're saying. Uh, I find the same thing happens on a variety of levels. Uh, fire is this often used metaphor. We say, I'm on fire. Dude, that's, we're on fire. And I always wondered when I was a very early Christian, like, I, what, fire? I don't know if I'm on fire. That doesn't sound pleasant. Um, or a uh, Water is another one. Fire and water and fruit. I don't know what it is, but Christians have these odd metaphors that they love and they roll with. Uh, I char find, a, find like a Christian music station that can go like one and a half songs without mentioning some reference to water or stream or a flood. <laughs> like, try it. I don't think they can do it. I think they are physically incapable of coming up. It's just, I'm not knocking it. It's a great metaphor. But the problem is when you use it so often, the thing you use so often, you become numb to what it actually even means. So I say fruit of the Spirit. We say, great. What does that mean? I don't know. But it is, it's a thing. It's totally a thing. Yeah, I get it's a thing. But what does it mean? What does it mean? And once we begin to think about it, what most people will begin to say is, well, fruit of the Spirit. You know, there's love, joy, peace, uh, forbearance, or, or, or patience. Forbearance is actually a better translated word because it has the... Um, uh, connotation of like a long suffering. You're having to endure, not just wait in a long grocery line, but you're actually having to endure through something. Love, joy. And so we say, fruit of the Spirit, man. This is what God wants to do. And we isolate love, we isolate joy, we isolate peace, and we say, I'm going to work on love this week, and joy that next week, and peace 
the one after, and I'm going to build my life up individually as I individually increase all these different dimensions of what God obviously wants to have more of flowing through my life. Uh, a really smart theologian by the name of Jonathan Edwards actually had this quote about the fruit of the Spirit, if we have that one. He said this. Uh, he was probably one of the most brilliant minds in uh, the formation of, uh, of America and so forth, and a brilliant pastor. And he said this, the fruit are not only always together and do arise from one another, but one is essential to another and belongs to the very essence of it. He was very smart. But if you track with what he's saying here, his suggestion is that the fruit cannot be parsed out individually, but they are interdependent. Meaning this, a lot of times if we were just to describe the fruit of the Spirit and talk about what's your favorite fruit of the Spirit or what fruit of the Spirit are you good at, uh, we think of the fruit, next slide, in terms of this sort of an image. Just like, just random fruit in a bowl. And you say, you know what, I'm kind of an apple sort of spirit person. I got joy down. I got joy down. One of, uh, in fact, Day Day, was it? Melissa Rogers, I call her Day Day. Uh, back in college, she's, she's over teaching, I'm just realizing now. We had a friend, a mutual friend, uh, back in college, and her email was joydispenser at hotmail.com. What a good, what a good email. I still remember it. Like 18 years later or something like that, Joy Dispenser. I don't think she uses it. Who uses Hotmail anymore, first of all? But <laughs> Joy Dispenser. So some of us, we just were good and we lean in directions, faithful or goodness or, yep, some of us have these things. And we think like, eh, I'm kind of like a kiwi guy or I'm kind of like a strawberry or I'm a banana guy or whatever. And we think of them all separately and independent. What Jonathan Edwards is getting at and what the fruit of the Spirit is really trying to communicate is something more like this. Next slide. A singular bunch of grapes with distinctive grapes but connected, interconnected to a singular bunch. Because if you'll notice, the writer of this letter said fruit, not fruits. Singular, not plural. Which means <clears throat> that unless you have all of them, you have none of them. That when the Spirit of God comes alive in you, it produces a little vine of fruit happening in you. And love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, all these different things begin to pop out of your life simultaneously and in a like, synchronized harmony with one another. You can't just say, well, God gave me a lot of joy, but I've got no peace. Or God gave me a lot of goodness, but I've got zero faithfulness. They only ever come together, or they are counterfeit. And let me explain what I mean by that. Can we go to the next slide? I'll give you guys a couple examples here. So what if someone is just super happy and bubbly, but is terrified of conflict? In Oregon, there's nobody like this. I realize nobody that's afraid of conflict. There's nobody that's passive aggressive. No one that's ever sarcastic, let alone pastors, right? No one would do such a thing. But imagine, if you will, someone who's like this. Um, I may or may not be married to someone like this. Let's just imagine that they could be out there in the ether somewhere. <clears throat> you might say, and maybe this person loves Jesus, and you might say, man, they have the fruit of joy. They have it. They got it. Joy, maybe kindness, they totally have it. But if they are terrified of conflict, they are in contradiction with the biblical fruit of goodness. And goodness is the idea of willing to do or say the right thing, even if it hurts. And so if you are, quote unquote, full of joy and full of kindness, but you're not willing to have the hard conversation, if you're not willing to speak up against things that are not the way that they're supposed to be, if you don't care about someone enough to tell them that something's going wrong in their life or they're headed towards a disastrous end, then my friends, that is not kind. It is not kind. But in fact, if you were to have someone full of joy and kindness and yet would not hesitate to say, you know what, I love you and you're an idiot and this is not wise, or this is hurting you, or this is hurting me, or this is not going to go well for you. That, that is the fruit of the Spirit in action. Now, for all of us, the reality is we may not come out of the Jesus womb, if you will, born again from day one with a fully formed bunch of grapes. We might have baby grapes. 
But when we only pick and choose out of them, we can just convert what looks like a religious appearance but as an actuality, just as selfish as we ever were before we knew Jesus. And I'm not quite sure when this ever happened, when somehow Christianity, the baseline for it just became niceness, if we're just nice enough. Niceness is great. Kindness is a fruit of the Spirit, for sure. But if we are just kind and reluctant to ever say anything hard or challenging, My friends, you are so far from the character and life of Jesus, it's ridiculous. Jesus is gangster sometimes. Uh, we, we We could do an entire sermon series on gangster Jesus and just how mean he can be. Like there's times where he is not warm and fuzzy. There are many times where he says things people don't want to hear. And there's many times where he just says stuff in order to get people to walk away to see if they'll actually fight through an initial offense to actually want to press into relationship with him. He's gangster like that. He's not just nice, come follow me, and you know what? Whatever you want to do, and wherever you want to go, it's all good. <laughs> I don't know if Jesus would ever pose like that. That was probably wrong to do. But, but you see here, they have to be working in tandem. Otherwise, you're just more concerned about what people think about you than you are about their well-being. It's not love. It's not goodness. It's a f- falsified, counterfeit version of joy. How about this one? I have, there's a lot of these in Oregon also. Next slide. What if someone is super chill? Like, way super chill, man. But, 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 that's a, maybe that's just a double negative. That, uh, does, that, does that cancel it out? That's a typo. But, but, but they don't keep their word. Super chill, never show up on time. No cares in the world, but never follow through on anything they say they're going to do. You might say, oh man, this guy, this girl, they are so chill. They have the peace of God, man, (laughs) right? I think you have to finish with that, man. They have, they've got peace. Like, don't you have a midterm tomorrow? I don't know. I think so. Like, whoa, most of us would be worried. You're not. Don't you have a big project due? Aren't your kids going to be up really early? Shouldn't you be going to bed? Eh, you know. And we say, we could say, doesn't that look like peace? But if you lack the fruit of faithfulness, follow through. If you lack the fruit that it actually honors someone else's time because you're never there on time, this isn't peace. This is apathy. And the antithesis of love is not hate. It is apathy. Because there's some things in this world you should get upset about. You should not be chill about, bro. And you should get worked up about. Some things you should. And the second I found you start caring about something other than yourself is when you start caring about the things that really matter in this world. I remember um, we had our first child. Who was, is he in here? There he is. All right, I won't say anything super embarrassing. I was wondering if you're in the room or not. <laughs> he's, uh, he's almost 13 now, but I remember when he was, he was first born, and then you look at this little pink, wrinkly, <laughs> like little screaming thing, like it fits like right about here, right? And uh, you look at this thing, and it's done, it's done nothing for you, and you just met him. <laughs> but you love him, right? Parents, correct? Please nod your heads. <laughs> you love them. And I remember the drive home from the hospital. And because I loved him, I was suddenly aware of so many things. Bad drivers. Did you know people in Oregon have a thing against using their blinkers? This is, a, this is an epidemic. It's a problem. And uh, I became one of those dads in a hurry. In a hurry, I was looking on Amazon to see if I could find a baby on board symbol or whatever, like, and just every like, hands ten and two, right? And uh, and you're just grumpy at everyone that's going even five miles over the speed limit. Like you just care about stuff now. And it's not because I do not have the peace of God per se. It is because I care about something other than myself. And because I care about something about myself, though I might be more naturally chill, drive, you do your thing, I do my thing, we'll just flexibly interpret the rules of the road. (laughs) 
Now we are by the stinking book. <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit only ever come together, or they aren't there at all. Or they aren't there at all. And here's the beautiful and best part of this whole thing. The good news of Jesus was never that you had a list of nine fruit that you were supposed to aspire to grow in, but you were given a promise of the person of God that would live in you and cause you to produce these fruit. Think about this. The idea of a fruit is that it's connected to a tree. When have you ever seen a tree work really hard to produce fruit? Right? That's just, Jesus said it like this. A good tree will just produce good fruit. If there's something right and healthy and life is filled in that tree, it'll produce what it's designed to produce. And if it's not filled with life or if it's not healthy, then it won't. But you never see a tree just kind of doing its... Like, that never happens. <laughs> like, you don't... That's an image you will not get out of your head quickly. I promise you that. Brain tattoos. We're doing lots of them here today. <clears throat> the good news of Jesus is that when you are filled with his spirit, fruit happens. It happens. And it may look like baby fruit. It may not be perfect. But when they're synced together and you, you, you find yourself wanting to express kindness and joy in the world, and maybe it's hard for you to have the hard conversations, but you, ooh, you, you step out and you risk it, and you do it imperfectly. And maybe you offend someone on accident, but you, you, you find yourself knowing that you can't just say nothing. It might be baby fruit that needs still some a little bit more maturation, but it's there, and it's growing. And just like that first weekend when I met Jesus and found the Spirit of God alive in me, the good news is not that you, you, have to grow the fruit out of your life, but you need to simply receive the Holy Spirit, walk by the Spirit, and the fruit of God will manifest themselves in your life. You've not been given a program of behavioral management. You've been given a person to develop a relationship with. And when you understand this, you walk in sync with this person. When I want this and the Spirit wants this, I just simply keep in step of where the Spirit's going. And when I stay close to him, the life of God remains in me, flourishes in me, and the fruit of God pours out of me. And what begins to happen is something that is so foreign and alien in our world. Because all we ever have are people that are good or a few of those things here and there. But when these things come together, like they did in the person of Jesus... It has the capacity to boggle minds and change the world. And it all starts, it all starts by not trying harder, but by simply allowing the life of God to come in you. For some of you, it might actually start by giving up. and Say, God, I am not going to just work harder at this. I'm just going to draw closer to you. I'm going to give up my independence and self-reliance and I'm actually going to allow your life to come in me and to have your way with me. And this beginning point is the most adventurous ride you'll ever be on. I hope my fruit is a little bit like less baby fruit than it was back then. <clears throat> but I know, I know, when the life of God is in me, the fruit of God will pour out of me. And I believe this is true, not just for you as individuals, but you as a church. The fruit of the Holy Spirit can come out of this place. There's power of the Holy Spirit and cool things of the Holy Spirit. Young, that's all great. If you miss out on the power of the Holy Spirit, that's sad. If you miss out on the fruit of the Spirit, it is utterly tragic. It can turn the world upside down and cause you to be everything that God has made you to be. And just because you're not all there now, don't give up. Spirit of God is available and able to walk you through. Yeah, let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the amazing gift of your Spirit. I want to thank you for the way that he has changed my life. He's changed so many lives in this place. I want to thank you for the amazing promise that by grace we can receive new life, that we can receive your presence, 
We don't have to work for it, strive for it, earn it. And I'm praying that even now, for those of us that have started our relationship with you out of a place of trust, would not try to continue that relationship out of a place of earning. And would you let your spirit come, change the way we feel even on the inside, change the way our heart is drawn and the way we desire and even our affections. Help us to love what you love. Father, I'm asking for those of us that even recognize now that if they're to look at all the different fruits and see that some are maybe being expressed without others and there's some that might not be right, I'm, I'm asking, you're not the God that wants to condemn and shame. You're the God that wants to redeem and make whole. So help us, Holy Spirit. Help us, Holy Spirit. Help us to let go of our self-interest and our selfishness and our apathy. Help us to let go and choose to love you and others. And God, make people in this place and this church as a whole a beacon that demonstrates your fruit to the city. Thank you for this, in Jesus' name.